this morning, it was really quiet. It was just really, there was just such a reverence in the room this morning, and that just led right into praise and worship, and it's just been such an encouraging morning. Um, and I was so excited as we were worshiping because Panina and I did not talk this week. We had no communication about, well, I didn't even know she was the worship leader, so I didn't ask her, what are you going to sing? And she didn't ask me, what are you going to preach? But as you'll see, God orchestrates everything. So let's pray, and then we'll get into the word. Father, we love you. We thank you that you are creator of everything. We thank you for this season as we approach Easter, God, as we remember the sacrifice that you sent your son. We thank you, Jesus, that you came. As we look into your word this morning, would you encourage us? Would you speak to our hearts? Would you correct us if we need correcting? Would you challenge us if we need to be challenged? Would you heal us? Would you refresh us? Would you speak to us this morning, Lord, as we look into your word? May you receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to look at a passage this morning from the Old Testament. Go all the way, very easy, very first book of the Bible. Everyone can find it. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 29, verses 31 through 35. And this is how it reads. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So she named him Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. And I want us to focus in today on that one little phrase she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So let's do, before we look deeply into these verses, I want to do a little background, a little refresher for some of us on the history, the family history of Rachel and Leah and Jacob. If we've grown up in church, we heard these stories, but it may have been a while, and some of us may not be so familiar. So let's do a little background. We have Jacob, one of the main characters in the story. Jacob at this point in his life, is on the run. He's fleeing from his brother Esau who wants to kill him because Jacob has stolen a birthright and a blessing. So Jacob is on the run. He runs to his mother's homeland, and there he finds some of his relatives, and he begins to work for his uncle Laban. Laban was very wealthy, lots of flocks, lots of sheep, wealthy man. So Jacob goes to work for uncle Laban. Laban had two daughters, Leah and Rachel. I see some of you have been to Sunday school. Our Sunday school teachers have trained you well. <laughs> well, the Bible says that Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Lovely figure and beautiful. If you don't understand what that means, let me help you. She was gorgeous. This woman was the picture of beauty. I mean, think of someone today who is just lauded as, this is what beauty looks like. You have Rachel. She is the glamour queen. She's beauty. I mean, the Bible gives us not just one description, but two, lovely figure and beautiful. I mean, they wanted to make sure we got it, just how beautiful this, one, this woman was. Rachel was the younger daughter, but Leah was the older daughter. They were opposites. While Rachel was described as lovely and beautiful, Leah was said to have weak eyes. Now we hear that today and we think, yeah, what's the big deal? But in that culture, weak eye, bright eyes were considered a sign of beauty. Leah did not fit the mold of what her culture 
called beautiful. Bible scholars have also described her as delicate, as weak, as soft-spoken, as dull-eyed. Who wants that to be how you're described? Her eyes are dull. She just she can't speak. She's just this little delicate wilting flower. I mean, imagine with me for just a moment the self-image issues that Leah grew up with. She's in the shadow of her younger, beautiful sister. Imagine how that affected her all of her life. And this is how she grew up. You've got the older sister and the younger sister, dull-eyed and bright-eyed, beautiful and eh, kind of blah. Let me just pause to say something for a second. Be careful who you let define you. Our culture has ideas of what beauty and success are, and they're the wrong ideas. Social media sets us up for self-criticism, for self-doubt, for second-guessing ourselves and not seeing ourselves as God created us. We all see the picture of the beautiful, smiling family with the lovely kids and everyone's smiling and they're all posed so delicate, but they didn't post the 14 pictures they took before that where one child's running this way and one child's screaming and mom's yelling and dad's just, oh, can we get this over with? All they post is the polished picture. Sister Beth has a nephew who's almost two, and her sister sent a picture recently, and James is just standing, and he's so cute, and he's just an adorable boy. And then her sister said, but you didn't see the 20 minutes it took me to get him to that way. But we focus on the the pretty, the polished. So be careful who you let define you. Be careful when you look at social media. You know, sometimes, especially for men, you'll see these pictures in the gym beside the workout equipment. (laughs) But they don't show you the five days that they hit snooze on the alarm and slept in. So again, just be careful who you let define you. So let's go back to to our family here. We've got Jacob, Leah, Rachel, and Laban, the father of Rachel and Leah. Jacob has gone to work for his uncle, and you know, this is family. Sometimes we take advantage of family, sadly. But Laban, seeming to be a good man, says to his nephew, you know, you shouldn't work for me for free just because we're family. Name your wages. All right, Jacob is excited because Jacob loves the beautiful one. Jacob loves Rachel, so he says, I will work for you for seven years to have Rachel as my wife. Done deal. All right. So Jacob goes to work for seven years. Oh, my goodness. We've watched in our church several marriages take place. We watched Ying and Jocelyn. Imagine if Jocelyn's father said to Ying, seven years. You give me seven years of service, and then you can have her hand. <laughs> then you can have her. You know, but we, we all watched as their relationship grew, and we've seen how much Ying loves Jocelyn. I think probably as much as Jacob loved Rachel, because the Bible says he worked seven years, but it seemed like just a few days, because he loved her so much. Whoa! Talk about a love story. A man who will herd sheep for you for seven years, who will sleep in the cold, who will be in the heat. Sheep are dumb. Sheep wander. you got to chase them. But he loved her so much. I'll do that for seven years just to have you. Whoa, what a love story. So the day finally arrives that they get to be married. Pastor Renee was asking people earlier, do you remember your wedding day? Do you remember your wedding day? And Jean said, yes, because <laughs> hers was recently. And many others, you know, I can see on your faces just that little gleam in your eyes. Yeah, you remember your wedding day. Oh, the anticipation leading up to it. Oh, get the dress ready, get all the arrangements ready. And you think about these two. Jacob has been chasing sheep, walking through what sheep deposit let's put it like that, for seven years. Can you imagine how excited he is? And Rachel, for seven years, has watched and waited, watched and waited, and it is finally wedding day, celebration time. 
But you know things are never straightforward, rarely straightforward, let me put it like that. You see, the custom in those days was for an older daughter to be married before the younger daughter. This was a big deal. Um, and I know this is a custom still in the Philippines. When my sister was getting married, I'm the oldest, when my sister was getting married about 20 years ago, we had some friends in the States who were from Philippines. And so they told me, they said, you know, Julie, in our country, when the younger daughter gets married first, she has to give a gift to the older daughter to appease her. So I shared with my sister, I said, I want my gift. <laughs> she said, we're not Filipino. I said, but it's a, good, it's a good practice. You should give me a gift. I didn't get a gift. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. It's okay. <laughs> but that was the, cult, the custom in this day. So the wedding day rolls around. Big celebration, big party. Laban tricked Jacob. He put Leah, the dark-eyed older daughter, in the bridal tent. Now, I don't know if there were no candles in the tent. I don't know if maybe Jacob was a little intoxicated because it had been a big celebration, but he didn't know it was Leah until the next morning. And at that point, guess what? They are legally married. He is enraged. Can you imagine? You have worked seven years. Seven years expecting this, and you get that. He is furious. I mean, you want to talk about family drama? Hollywood did not invent family dramas. Go back to the Bible. It's really, really exciting. I mean, here we've got deception, lying, sibling rivalry, hatred, complete humiliation, just to name a few emotions. Jacob has been deceived. Leah has been used as a pawn. Rachel has been cheated out of her wedding day. They've all three been humiliated. What a way to start a marriage. What a way to start a marriage. Laban, he played a role in this family drama. See, he knew the custom. He could have told Jacob at the beginning of the seven years, Leah has to get married first, but he said nothing. He could have, he had seven years. In seven years, he could have tried to find a wife for Leah, but we've got no, uh, for, yeah, he could have tried to find a husband. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, husband for Leah, but we've got no record. He just waited for seven years because, you know, Jacob's a good man. He's a hard worker. He's taking care of the family business. He waited and he tricked Jacob into marrying Leah. His actions speak volumes. He's essentially said, the only way Leah's going to get married is if I trick somebody into it. Imagine your dad thinking that about you. The only way, you're so dull, you're so unattractive, the only way you're going to get married is if I trick somebody. Somebody who's already grown up with all of that self-doubt, and now dad has to trick somebody? Wow. Can't even un understand. Laban, using the excuse of customary practice, caused hatred to thrive between his daughters and set up a pattern of deception and trickery with his son-in-law. We'll read further into Jacob's story that Laban changed his wages seven times. Seven times. I mean, this man was a trickster. Wow. Family drama started in the Bible. So here we pick up with our text that we started with. Jacob does get to have Rachel too, but for seven more years of hard labor. So now Jacob is married to two women, one that he loves, one that he hates. One he loves, one he hates. In fact, in verses 31 and 33 of our text, it says that Leah is not loved. That literally meant in the original language, she was hated. She was hated, hated by her sister. I mean, could you imagine? Of course, I think if I was Rachel, I might hate her. You robbed me of my wedding day? What? You've taken my husband too? Jacob hated her. I didn't work for you. I worked for her. She's hated. Leah has never fit in. 
She's never been considered beautiful. She's never fit in. Now she's hated. She's broken and despised. But God, but God saw her. Although Jacob did not love her, he could not neglect the duties of a husband. So I will give Jacob credit for that. He did take care of his husbandly duties. Leah gets pregnant. The Bible says that God opened Leah's womb and Rachel remained childless. So Leah gets pregnant. Can you imagine the anticipation she must have felt? The excitement? Okay, I'm going to have a baby. Maybe, just maybe, this baby will solve all my problems. Maybe my husband will love me. Maybe this will fix everything, especially if it's a boy, especially if it's a boy, because boys were highly, highly valued. And she gives birth to a boy. This is the best gift a wife could give to a husband. There's nothing better she could do than give him a son. And she names the baby Reuben, which means to see or behold a son. All her life, Leah has been in the shadow of her sister's beauty. This is her chance to be seen, to be valued. But nothing changed. Nothing changed. She did the best. She produced a son. This should fix it. Nothing changed. Have you been there? Unseen, unvalued, perhaps in your family or on your job or at school, you strive and you struggle to be seen, you achieve a huge milestone, you have the best presentation at work, your house is immaculate, you've done everything the employer asked of you, everything your spouse has ever asked, you've done it with perfection. You think, okay, this is now they'll see me, now they'll notice me, and nothing changes. It is heartbreaking. It reinforces all the feelings and doubts that have plagued us for years. Leah gave birth to a son. This should have fixed it. This should have won her husband's love, but it didn't. Still unloved, still broken, she can't even rejoice over what God has done for her, over the gift he's given her. She can't even see it. But God blesses her a second time. Baby number two is coming. Okay, first attempt, not so good. Baby number two, and when she starts to dream, and she starts to dream, and she starts to dream, maybe, okay, they didn't see me, maybe he'll hear me. Remember, one of the descriptions of her was soft-spoken. She gives birth to another son. Yes, okay, surely this will do it. Surely Jacob will love her. It's a second son. She's given him not one, but two. I remember when, um, when Princess Diana was pregnant many, many years ago, and the, the joy when she had number, son number one, and then son number two, and I remember hearing the term, she had an heir and a spare. So <laughs> two boys. In case anything happens to number one, there's the next one. So here's Leah now, an heir and a spare. Two sons. I mean, what more could Jacob ask of her? She's given two sons. She names this baby Simeon, meaning the one who hears. When we want to be heard, what we're really saying is, notice me, pay attention to me. Leah wanted to be loved by her husband. She wanted to be heard for him to notice her. But again, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Disappointed yet again, she sees only the broken things in her life. There's no rejoicing over a son, no excitement in her, disappointment again. And we've been there too, haven't we? We strive and we strive and we strive and think, okay, success at work, number one, didn't work. Let me try this one. And we do it again and nothing changes unseen, unheard, unloved. We can't even see the goodness of God. And yet a third time, God blesses Leah. She becomes pregnant again. 
others would have looked at Leah and said, how blessed you are. Two babies and one more is coming. We read story after story in the Bible of women who were desperate to have a child. And now Leah's getting ready to have number three. I mean, this should be exciting. Baby number three is born. And the name she gives him lets us know that Jacob still has no affection for her. She names the boy Levi, which means attached. She says, at last my husband will become attached to me. I've borne him three sons. Can you hear the desperation in her statement? I thought he would see me, thought he would hear me, thought he would love me. I don't know what else to do. Three sons. Surely now, finally, he'll choose me. I won't be in the shadow anymore. He'll be attached to me. The heartache that must have followed when once again her best was not good enough. All she focused on was the missing affirmation and the missing affection of her husband. She couldn't even see the blessing of three sons that God had given her. But how many times have we been there? We strive, we struggle, we do our very best. Okay, this is gonna fix it, it doesn't. Okay, I'll try again. Do my best, do my best, do my best. It doesn't fix it. We try and we try and we try again and we fall into the pattern that Leah fell into. We see what's missing. We see our brokenness. We cannot, or maybe even more accurately, we don't step back and look at what God is doing and look at how good he is and what he has done. We keep going and we keep perpetuating the cycle of brokenness and of hurt. But God came to Leah's aid one more time. God blessed her again and she was able to conceive a fourth time. She had named each of her previous children with names, with a name that represented her pain and her expectations of other. Reuben, see me. Simeon, hear me. Levi, attach to me. But something happened when baby number four arrived. She finally, finally set her gaze on God. She finally chose to look to the only one who could help her. She chose to do the one thing that could shift her expectations. She chose to praise God. She said, this time, this time, I will praise the Lord. She gave the baby a name that represented her new perspective, Judah, which comes from the Hebrew word for praise. She named the baby praise. She named him Judah. Let me ask a question. What happened between the birth of Levi and the birth of Judah? Nothing. Nothing changed. She was still unloved. We have, no, we have no record of her father apologizing to her. We've got no record at this point of her reconciling with her sister. We have no record at this point of Jacob loving her, but she chose to praise the Lord despite her circumstances. She chose to lift up God, to set her attention on his goodness. You see, when we make that choice, everything changes. We begin to see who God says we are. He says in Ephesians chapter 1 that we are accepted. Ephesians 1 verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. He says we're accepted. When we put our eyes on him, we begin to understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. When we choose to praise and we choose to put our eyes on him, we understand that we are his handiwork. Ephesians 2.10 says, 
for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do when we choose to put our eyes on him and we choose to worship and to praise him we understand what Colossians 2 10 says you are complete in him pastor Renee mentioned it earlier we are complete in Christ who is the head of all principality and power when we choose to put our eyes on Jesus and worship him we understand what is said in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. He will take delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The Lord rejoices over us with singing. We begin to understand what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4. I can do all all things through Christ who gives me strength. When we put our eyes on him and not on our circumstances, we begin to see his blessings. We begin to understand our identity is in him and not in the labels that society or family or employers have put on us. They say we're weak-eyed. They say we're not smart enough. They say we're not attractive enough, but God says we're complete. God says we're accepted. God says we can do all things through him. You see, when we begin to praise the Lord, he begins to move on our behalf. He begins to defeat our enemies for us. Second Chronicles tells the story that, the, that God's children were getting ready to go out into a battle and they didn't know what to do. So they came to the Lord and they made a decision. We're not sending the warriors out first. We're sending the praisers out in front. And this is how it reads in uh, verses 21 and 22 of Second Chronicles chapter 20. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated as they began to praise the Lord. The army was still there. The army hadn't gone anywhere. They were still coming to attack, but God's children chose to praise him first and God defeated their enemy. When we begin to praise God despite our circumstances, despite what's coming right at our face, and it's real. Sometimes we, we fall into this, this trap and say, oh, it's all right, I'm okay, I'm okay. No, there's a real battle. There's a real crisis going on. It's okay to say I'm in a crisis, but praise him in the crisis. Praise him in the middle of it and watch what God will begin to do on your behalf. You see, praise also breaks chains and praise also gives opportunity for others to hear about Christ. We go to the book of Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas are in jail. They are in prison. I mean, can it get much worse than being in prison? Being locked up, they've been beaten. They're in prison, and they chose to praise the Lord. Verses 25 and 26 say, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And we know immediately following this, the jailer runs in and what's going on? He's ready to kill himself because if the prisoners escape, Rome will kill him. So he's going to just preemptive measure kill himself. But he runs in and Paul and Silas say, we're all here. Don't, don't harm yourself. And he looks at them and says, what must I do to be saved? It started because Paul and Silas chose to praise God. They chose in the middle of a horrible circumstance to praise God. And God gave them out of that an opportunity to win the Philippian jailer and his family 
to Christ. History tells us that most likely the church in Philippi was started by that jailer, that he became the pastor. But it all started because two men, despite their circumstances, said, we're going to praise God. We're going to praise him in the middle of this. When we praise God, we are refreshed and it leaves no room for negativity, no room for complaining because we have put our eyes on the one who is in control. I love Psalm 103, verses one to five say this, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So the question becomes for us, Lighthouse, what will we choose? What are we going to choose? Are we going to choose to look at our circumstances, at our brokenness, at our pain, at the affirmation we haven't received that we thought we needed? Or like Leah, are we going to say, this time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. Let's go back to Leah for just a second. We kind of left her hanging there after baby number four. But there's not a lot recorded about her after chapter 30. She had a few more children. She had two more sons and a daughter. But we don't know a whole lot about her. But we do know a couple of things. One, she was the mother of two of the most important influential family lines in the Bible. Levi. From him came Moses and the priestly line. And from Judah came David and the lineage of Christ. All this from the lady whose culture told her, you don't measure up. Mm, mm. But we also know something else about her. At some point, Jacob's heart toward her changed. Don't know exactly when, but at some point, his heart did change toward her. And we see that when Jacob is getting ready to die in chapter 49 of Genesis. Jacob's getting ready to die. He's lived a long life. They're in Egypt now. And he calls all in all the sons to give instructions. This is what you're to do when I die. And verse 29 through 31 say this. Then he gave them these instructions. I am about to die. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre and Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial, pe burial place from Ephron the Hittite. Listen to this last verse. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. When it was all said and done, Leah was the one buried with the family in the place of honor. Earlier in the story, we found out that Rachel was buried on the side of the road somewhere while they were on the way. But Leah, the one who started out unloved, unwanted, at some point there was a change and she was buried in the place of honor. When did it happen? I don't know, but I think I know when the change started. I think the change started when she said, I will praise the Lord. So what will you choose today? Let us be people who will choose to praise, people who see the goodness of God, people whose praise compels God to move on our behalf, people with no room for negativity and complaining, people refreshed, by God. This time, I will praise the Lord. And I want us to put that into practice before we leave. I've asked Panina um, and the praise team to come back. And I want us to put this into practice. And we're going to sing what we sang at the beginning. Every praise is to our God. Stand with 
Go ahead, sleep.